Uh, today I have a guest here is uh, we're up at OSHU and I met Dr. Elani uh, uh, Wabe. Is that right? Did I say it right? Helene Wabe. It's pretty Helene good. Wabe, uh, uh, who is working with post-traumatic stress on a, a number of different levels. Uh, recently I saw an article <clears throat> on Huffington Post about uh, brain scan. <clears throat> the individual damage of uh, post-traumatic stress. It's, it's at, uh, addressing both the issues of uh, 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 post-traumatic brain injury and post-traumatic stress. And they were looking at scans, uh, what they called uh, diffusion tensor imaging, in which they saw that there were gaps in the brain that is causing some of the problems of the brain communicating with other parts of the brain. Uh, so when we start talking about this, what this kind of imaging means and the kind of research that you're doing, uh, we need to first kind of talk a little bit about what is post-traumatic brain. I mean, what is uh, post-traumatic stress? What does it mean? What what kind of diagnosis do you have on that? So people understand what that really sure. is. Sure. So post-traumatic stress mm -hmm. disorder happens when someone experiences a traumatic event. And that traumatic event um, threatens their life or the life of someone that they're watching in that moment. Mm -hmm. And during that event, that person experiences incredible fear and helplessness in the moment of that event. So many people might experience a traumatic event like that and then just recover and be okay with it. But people who get PTSD end up having a whole constellation of symptoms after experiencing the event that stays with them. And those um, symptoms include re-experiencing the event over and over again with intrusive thoughts, dreams, um, and flashbacks even. They also um, numb and avoid. So they avoid situations that remind them of the traumatic event. So um, they might not be want to go to crowds or movie theaters or specific neighborhoods in town that remind them of their event. Um, and then what I most see with combat veterans are the hyper arousal symptoms. And that is being hyper vigilant, always being conscious of your environment, always knowing what's going on around you, doing um, door locking and perimeter checks of your home, not being able to sit with your back against the door, um, and then having, you know, your heart racing and feeling, um, you know, more kind of fight or flight symptoms when something scares you or a, a increased startle response. It also includes um, not sleeping very well, poor concentration, and increased irritability and anger, which is, I think, where where the combat vets who come back who have PTSD can potentially get into trouble is this increased anger and irritability. Well, I know for myself that um, um, I have gaps in memory, too. And then at other times, it triggers certain kinds of memories, which uh, uh, it seems as though I try to put a wall up around certain things that I don't want to know or remember because uh, mm -hmm. it was either too traumatic or... Uh, or something, because I can't figure it out, and I'm right. in therapy for that. Uh, uh, I remember one time being going on a trip to actually going to Cuba on this uh, trip, and we had some Vietnam veterans with us, and this is way before I joined um, Veterans for Peace. Um, and there was a guy he'd take off at night, and I said, what the, "Where the heck's he going?" They said, "Well, he's watching the perimeter. He can't sleep." Right. And uh, I was just amazed by that, and so I was just seeing bits and pieces of this from people. Um, also, what about uh, domestic violence, uh, people in their homes, anger, this rage that you're talking about? Right. So, um, you know, we've seen in the, in the news lately pieces of that, and um, there hasn't been any kind of specific studies looking at do people with PTSD, you know, have more domestic violence or more violence in general. Um, but... Um, the increased anger and irritability makes them more prone to violent episodes. That's one of the criteria for PTSD is this increased anger. Well, in that increased anger, I mean, is it, is the anger about uh, um, the loss of memory? Is it the loss of this something inside them that they, they witnessed something that happened, maybe a terrible uh, death or friend, uh, death of a friend? Um, is it just that event? I mean, there are people that have suffered uh, uh, terrible, I mean, the victims of war, uh, and we don't hear real studies on the, the victims of war, that, or I've, I've heard some studies would say uh, people that are fighting in their own country don't suffer uh, post-traumatic stress in the same levels that 
we as somebody that goes over to that war and uh, are an aggressor, let's say. Mm -hmm. So is there a difference between aggressor and, and somebody that's defending themselves in a situation? You mean their trauma, like yeah, the yeah. trauma that affects them? I don't think that the irritability and anger is directly related to the traumatic event. So it's kind of like a um, people with PTSD have a short fuse, mm -hmm. and it doesn't matter what the context is. That's they could point. be cooking dinner, uh -huh. and a pot falls on the ground, spilling the dinner everywhere. Mm -hmm. That would make anybody mad, right. right? But it would make them more mad. They might slam cabinets or kick the table or you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. So um, it's kind of like just this underlying irritability and anger that um, is present for people with PTSD regardless of whether they were an aggressor or the victim. But the traumatic event for PTSD you have to feel incredible fear and helplessness. So combat veterans are often in both situations where they are the you know the perpetrator and the perpetratee and so they are in these situations where they might feel incredible um, helplessness and fear whether they're being shot at or whether they're shooting someone else and so on some level it doesn't matter what role you're playing in the event you can still have those same emotions does that make sense yeah it does make sense I mean I, I've talked to uh, many friends who just returned and stuff and they were saying that they've been put in situations where uh, they have to fire back and they didn't want it. I mean it's right. the idea that, that they're they're trying to save their lives so you, like you say there's fear there's also um, um, there, there's some people that are upset that they were put in those positions when they felt that they didn't have to be put in those positions. Mm -hmm. That sense of helplessness. I feel that when I hear you know uh, veterans coming back and trying to go through uh, to get help and then they find themselves unable to go through the bureaucracy or um, uh, or they go through you know just recently we had somebody who's homeless and we're trying to help them get a place and we called up a place and you put on this line put on that line put on this line go be mm -hmm. referred to this person and you get somebody and they say we have to refer you to somebody else right. and their anger just goes sky high and they can right. just hang up that phone and it's hard to reach out to them um, for me, you know, I do Tai Chi as a way of trying to release the stress that I have in uh, daily life and when I'm dealing with things that are just really bothering me uh, about, because I constantly think about the war. I constantly think about what happened. Um, my brother also went into the service uh, with me, and, and he's literally, you know, um, uh, only given a few months to live. So we had gone through these things, and those kinds of stressors, you know, I, I can't seem to stop every time I turn on the news, every time I'm dealing with mm -hmm. somebody seeking help and trying to get them that help. So it, it raises my level, and I know that people that are trying to find that help. One of your studies is basically trying to help people mm -hmm. dealing with that stress, right? Right. Could, if I came in to you and, and we began talking like this, and I'm telling you about my story, wh where would we begin? How this, would this work? Um, well, this specific study is for combat veterans with PTSD. Mm -hmm. So the first thing that I would be doing is establishing whether you're a combat veteran and whether you have PTSD. And mm -hmm. so that's basically um, an interview that you do with me that usually takes about an hour, hour and a half, uh -huh. and um, sharing your um, traumatic story and how it affects you today. Mm -hmm. And then I make the diagnosis of PTSD, if you whether you have it, already or not. Mm -hmm. So you may have a diagnosis of PTSD, but I will still go through that interview. Mm -hmm. And then um, if you are eligible to continue and you want to continue, then we would set up a time for you to come back and um, collect inf information from your body. Because the goal of this study is to look at how um, meditation and slow breathing affects the systems of your body and that is through trainings that happen once a week for six weeks and then with home practice. And so um, I kind of want to back up just a minute because sure. you started with the, the brain imaging study right. and start. you might wonder, well, why are you looking at meditation for people with PTSD? Right. And um, I've been interested in mind-body medicine and meditation for a long time and um, as a practitioner and as a physician and so it's always been something that was interesting to me and I started reading about brain imaging studies of people who meditate and 
there are certain parts of the brain that regulate emotion and help us kind of calm down our emotions in periods of, of stress. Right. And people who meditate, this area of their brain is um, less reactive, meaning that they're, they're, they aren't as reactive to emotion. It's called the amygdala, and it regulates our fear response. Then the front part of the brain that's kind of the manager of how, what we perceive from our environment and how we're going to react to it was working really well in people who are meditating. And then I got into PTSD, and when you read PTSD imaging studies, you find the opposite pattern. So their emotional reactivity areas are um, overactive. So when something triggers them, they're, they're overreacting to the scenario, and the frontal part of their brain is not working as well. It's not able to manage it as well. And so my thought was that meditation would be a great therapy mm -hmm. for people who had PTSD because of those, that brain imaging. And so meditation includes lots of different aspects to it. Mm -hmm. And um, part of it is specifically mindfulness meditation, which is what I'm doing. The mindfulness piece is about really being conscious and present in your body in the moment. And so... Um, with that, it doesn't matter whether you're focusing on your breathing or walking or eating, you are, your attention is always on exactly what you're doing right now, which can also help people with PTSD because the flashbacks and you, like you said, the memories keep coming in. Mm -hmm. So it's like, okay, now I'm coming back to now. Now I'm coming back to now. Anyway, skeptics might say, well, when you meditate, your breathing slows down. And we all know that when you slow your breathing down, it increases the relaxation response. And so that's why meditation is working. Mm -hmm. So the goal of this study is to kind of tease apart if it's the kind of meditation mindfulness piece of it, or if it's the slow breathing that is helping people with PTSD reduce their symptoms. Um, well, how does your study show that 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 is the case. I mean, you're, you, you're using uh, EEGs, right? Uh, yeah, so, so we're, looking, we're looking at um, mm -hmm. brain function through EEG. Mm -hmm. We're also looking at heart um, action, heart rate variability and heart rate, um, respiration and blood pressure. And then people um, get put into one of four groups. The first group is a meditation group. That is just <clears throat> meditation. It's like a body scan where they focus on different parts of their body. The second group is um, a meditation that's focused on slowing their breathing down consciously. The third group is slow breathing without any meditation concepts at all. So they're just, we just say slow your breath and we don't talk about the mindfulness at all. And then the fourth group is listening to a book on tape and they get to pick one of four tapes and they um, do the same thing that everybody else is doing in terms of the visit numbers. Is there is there a sort of biofeedback going on in any of these where you they actually see how their brain is reacting while they're trying to do this meditation? They that, don't, no. Um, we aren't including that in it yet. <laughs> um, the breathing device is called a, a respirate device and it actually is a biofeedback device because it registers the rate of um, someone's breathing and then with music helps slow, th slow it down. Well, I know that uh, many uh, Vietnam veterans that I, I met over the years, a lot of them uh, graduated towards meditation, so mm -hmm. became Buddhists, you right. know, uh, seeking a, a way to, to deal with these demons in their, in their brain, you know. Um, myself, like I said, I do Tai Chi, but I remember when I first came back, I'm the product of the 60s, you know, you had the Beatles, and uh, um, Maharishi Yogi, who, you know, we did uh, Transcendental Meditation. And I actually, when I came back, I did Transcendental Meditation. Um, and it helped. It was a, a process that I could learn to do that, you know. Mm -hmm. And I would do that when I was really troubled about things. But I didn't think of it as therapy. I was just, right. it was a, kind of the thing to do in those days, you know. And, and I was trying to seek enlightenment, which mm. never seemed to happen. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's supposed to take a while. <laughs> but uh, it, it probably did help in some ways because I still revert back to uh, technique, 
when I'm really under a lot of stress, mm -hmm. you know. And so that's one way. And uh, some of the things that I, I, I was reading recently that um, some conditions of, of post-traumatic stress, which leads people to um, increased risks of alcohol, drug uh, abuse, um, smoking, obesity, diabetes, uh, heart disease, hypertension, elevated lipids, um, and other psychiatric disorders. So uh, that was from a recent study at the Mayo Clinic. And when I think about uh, all of these different things, it's also related to, you know, how do you, how do you distinguish between people that were exposed to chemicals, uh, people that were exposed to, uh, like myself, uh, Agent Orange. So I have other relations uh, to uh, diabetes and uh, other things with my heart I uh, have to watch. Uh, so when you're dealing with these guys and they've been in Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, they're exposed to uh, a lot of toxic chemicals, um, 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 oil, <coughs> you know, the, the oil wells that were burning, that smoke and oil that they were breathing, and sometimes even the medication that they were given. Mm -hmm. How do you, is that part of the screening process that you look at what other kinds of things they were exposed to? We do um, ask information about that and they fill out a whole questionnaire talking about what they were exposed to in terms of that and also um, we get information about their general health and it is pretty clear at this point that people with PTSD do have higher rates of other medical conditions. That's pretty clear across the board and um, we all know that stress is bad for your health right. and PTSD affects multiple levels of a person's system. So it affects their immune system, it affects their um, nervous system, and their hormonal system. It affects every aspect of it, being in that constant state of anxiety, fear, and stress. And also, depression is a very um, big comorbid um, mental health condition with PTSD. And so, um, Yes, people with PTSD are not as healthy usually. It's not just limited to the kind of mental health aspects of it. And we do collect that information. Um, but again, for my study, we're keeping it pretty broad. Mm -hmm. And we just say mm -hmm. that people need to be in good general health. You know, that means they can have high cholesterol and high blood pressure and diabetes and all this stuff, but um, in good general current health. How many people do you have in your program right now? Um, we have had um, 14 people. One of them, 13 have completed, and one of them is still in the program. And um, I got a grant from the National Institute of Health that is, is funding this study, and it's for five years, and we're to um, complete 100 people. So we have 86 more people to go. Are there other, <coughs> other states that are doing similar projects uh, following your model here? It, as far as I know, we are the only one in the nation that is doing this study. That's great. Yeah. Uh, and you have, I mean, the veterans' hospitals just down the street from here. Yeah. Uh, you said you sometimes you get people from there that are referred up here so that they can go through the program. Yeah, we connect with the clinicians at the VA and also put flyers up there. I'm also part of a, a veterans' resource. Um, group where providers of veteran resources all get together. Our last meeting we had like 65 people in there wow. all waiting to help veterans. It's pretty amazing actually. I'll get you that list. That, that's good. <laughs> and uh, mm. so I connect with them and um, interact with them just to make sure that um, people know that we are around. And People often ask, well, how much do they have to pay to be in your study? And they don't pay anything. In fact, we pay them. So we pay our participants um, up to $100. Is, if um, somebody's interested in coming, how do they, how do they get in touch? So they're, um, they call my research assistant, Jennifer, who's wonderful. Her, her phone number is 503-494-7399. And we'll get that up on, uh, yeah, on our sure. program on the screen. Um, is there a website that tells people more about this, too? There is a website, an OHSU website, that I can give you also. Okay, that yeah. would be great. One of the, the other things is, is, let's say, you know, right now, I, was, I came in, I passed all the tests. What would I first do? What would you do? What's the, if you were hooking me up here, what was this stuff here all about? 
So first, um, we would put a, a cap on your head <laughs> that would be collecting the, um, the data from your brain, the information coming off your brain. We would put a belt around your waist to measure your breathing rate and um, some pads here to measure your heart rate and then a little band around your finger to measure blood pressure. And then you would be sitting in the chair and um, Jennifer would run you through a number of, of tests um, looking at memory and concentration and um, also having you read a story mm. so that we can record your voice. Um, we have a, a researcher we're collaborating with that's looking at how stress influences voice parameters and being able to see if we can see stress in, in the voice. Just reading is a lot of stress. It's reading yeah. out loud. <laughs> yeah. And a uh, um, bunch of different tests like that. And that would be the first visit. Mm -hmm. Then you would come back um, for your second visit. And at that point, you would know what group you were in. Mm -hmm. And that visit does not include the the EEG, but it does include the other um, pieces, and that's when you would do your training. Mm -hmm. So, for example, if you were in um, the meditation group, you would get an iPod, that, and you would listen to um, a track on that iPod, and it's my voice, and I would be running you through the meditation that would take about 20 minutes. And while you're in the lab, we record the physiological data while you're doing the meditation. So it's, the visit's less than a half an hour. And then you go home and you practice with the meditation once a day, every day, until your next visit, which is a week later. So then you come into the lab here once a week for six weeks to do the trainings in the lab. And um, you practice at home in between. And you get this cool little iPod and you get to listen to the music on the iPod. And um, at the end of the six weeks, we do the same visit that we did for the first visit, where we hook you up to everything and do all the different tests again, mm -hmm. um, and then you're free to go. Would there be a follow-up in years later to see how well that, uh, how people continued, you know, right. uh, with it? At this point, we're just focusing on those um, six weeks of training. Right. Um, doing follow-up visits is a lot more challenging and it would be ideal to do that and yet because of our limited resources at this point we're just doing the six weeks. The other thing I didn't mention is um, between the first and the second visit you get sent home with a, a PDA device. Which is? Can I grab this here? This is um, a little device that is a you know a little computer. These are personal desk computers. I forget what they're called. And um, it gets scheduled to go off four times randomly in a 24-hour period. And um, it beeps like that when it's time for you to open it up and do a couple tasks. So the first task is a voice recording. And so you say who you are with, where you are, and what you've been doing for the last 10 to 15 minutes before mm -hmm. the alarm went off. And then it runs you through a bunch of different questions. How relaxed are you? How stressed are you? How do you feel you're coping? Are you in the present moment? And you just kind of tap on the screen. And then it does a two-minute um, attention task where um, you push the screen when it's an O, but don't push it when it's a Q. And it's flashing very quickly. And so you have to be very focused and attentive to be able to do that properly. Um, so that will happen four times in a 24-hour period. You get to tell Jennifer when you're going to be working or sleeping or, you know, you can't do it during this time because I'm going to be busy. Uh -huh. um, and then it goes off randomly during those other and, times. And so does that just directly come here or does it, do they bring it back in? And they bring it back in and then we download the data. And so, and this happens at the beginning of the study and the end of the study. And what we call this is experience-based sampling because being in the lab is very different from being at home. And so we get to see um, what their experience is like at home, which is, I think, interesting for people with PTSD. Yeah, there's, um, there's a couple other things I wanted to, to mention to people that one of the things is, is we're talking about post-traumatic stress. Right now from the Afghan and Iraqi wars, we're talking about uh, 
Oh, I think it's about 350,000 people with post-traumatic stress and almost an equal number with post-traumatic brain injury. Um, Fort Hood, of course, uh, raises the issue about po what post-traumatic stress is going through, although uh, the doctor who committed uh, those uh, horrible attacks upon his own uh, soldiers, uh, psychiatrist, wasn't, didn't serve in a, a war zone, he did have to listen to so many stories of people that have been coming back and then his own religious beliefs and uh, things that were involved. So stress is, is being built up on from people not just about the war but you know uh, even hearing this stuff. I mean uh, I imagine family members too. Have you worked with family members that uh, their husband or sp wife uh, served over there and they themselves are going through like second uh, 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 post-traumatic stress, you know, second person? Yeah, I, I don't personally work with the spouses, although I do hear the stories. Uh -huh. um, and PTSD has a huge effect on social systems and mm -hmm. relationships. And divorce is huge, estrangement from children. There's just an isolation that people with PTSD feel that they are not able to connect in the same way that they used to. There's an emotional numbness. Um, the nightmares are also a really big deal for spouses because the person with PTSD might wake up, you know, I've heard of people choking their spouse or assaulting them or, you know, because they're, they're in it, they're living it right. in that moment. And it takes the spouse a while to wake them up and say, look, look, you're here, I'm me. And that is incredibly stressful for both parties. Right. Um, and so are the spouses developing post-traumatic stress disorder because of that? I don't really know that. There is a researcher here, Dr. Louie at OHSU, who's doing a study specifically for spouses, and she does a group support um, system for them. And well, that's good for people to know, too, that there would be yes. an opportunity for your spouse to go through this and also to help them understand what their uh, spouse who had served in combat right. was going through. That makes it incredibly helpful because if the spouse knows what the symptoms are and understands how to potentially support them with that, then they don't take it personally anymore. So like the irritability and the anger and the nightmares, it's like, you know, what's wrong with you? Why are you treating me like this? It's like, okay, it's the PTSD and, and how do I help them with that? Well, I also know that, you know, that uh, uh, I've talked with veterans who years and years, especially Vietnam veterans, I've heard that um, post-traumatic stress has, has risen in, in uh, uh, Vietnam veterans who had had it buried for years and all of a sudden it's been mm -hmm. triggered by uh, these wars. So they seemed to have functioned well in society and everything was going fine and all of a sudden uh, it's as though something triggered this and they're going back through this and reliving this and going through this stuff all over again. So my, that's why I was asking about right. follow-up, you know, how important it would be to follow up to see how people are doing over a longer period of time and see how that functions yeah. with them. Many of the people um, in my study are Vietnam Is veterans, right? yes. And it's fascinating because the culture um, when the Vietnam veterans were coming back was very, very different to what the um, Iraqi and Afghanistan soldiers are coming back to because um, PTSD wasn't even known about. Right. It may have existed, but it wasn't given a clinical name. And they had and it, shell shock. And, yeah, and, and, and it was like you're supposed to just come back and fit right in and, and deal, essentially. Mm -hmm. And so what's happening now with the current wars is that it's on the media everywhere you can't turn or take a step without seeing images and it's triggering these old memories for Vietnam veterans mm -hmm. and so I believe that and there's also a lot of information about what PTSD is and what the symptoms are and it's like wow I've had that for 40 years mm -hmm. how do I get rid of it you know like can I right. get rid of this now so, well, there's also the stigma, you know. I mean, right. if, if people decide, you know, I mean, they've made a career in the military and they want to go up in the ranks and there's a stigma if you have uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, it's as though you have some mental disease. Um, but can we talk a little bit about the idea of the stigma and how 
to me, I mean, if you if you've witnessed uh, uh, this sort of trauma, it's a normal process. I mean, that's what everybody who's got experienced these things. Uh, it would be sort of yeah, you have post traumatic stress. It's not something that you have a mental disease uh, of sorts. This is a reaction which is normal. Right. Uh, body is trying to protect itself. It's trying to understand what is going on, and so you're trying to help them realize that it's not nothing's their fault. This is Right. Something that we're trying to help you with and then control the symptoms that you have. Right. right? Well, I think that um, the more we understand it and the closer we get to being able to manage and or heal the symptoms completely, mm -hmm. the less the fear of stigma will prevent them from getting help. So, you know, if tomorrow the magic bullet showed up for healing PTSD, I imagine more people would show up instead of feeling like, oh God, I have to go sit in these groups and I have to tell my story. I don't want to talk about my story. I don't want to hear anyone else's story. I don't want to keep talking about it and reliving it. The other reason why I think meditation might be really um, good for people with PTSD is right now the, the most evidence for the effective treatment is called prolonged exposure therapy, which essentially includes reliving your trauma over and over again and reframing it and um, kind of facing the fear, if you will. And so many people cannot tolerate this and they won't go through that therapy. And so meditation doesn't require you to be in a group social situation and it doesn't require you to have to go through your trauma over and over again. It's basically about, well, how can I just stay in the moment and experience what I'm experiencing, feel what I'm feeling, and be okay with it. Okay, I, I just want to let some people know here that there are, like we said, there's other people out there that are helping people. Uh, there's also the Northwest Returning Veterans Project, and there are a lot of volunteer uh, clinicians there to help uh, returning veterans and their families, and they they have alternative medicines available. People are volunteering their time. They want to help veterans. Mm -hmm. um, and your program here, of course, we'll put that up on the uh, on the screen so that people can contact you and your therapist. You want to say the therapist's name again and the phone number one more time that we can contact you if they're interested. Yes, her name's Jennifer Bishop, and the phone number is 503-494-7399. And this is Dan with uh, Veterans uh, for Peace Forum and uh, Dr. Uh, Elani uh, uh, Wabe. And we're so thankful that you're doing this research and we want to, to get as many people to know and understand about this. And is there other ways that people can support? Is there uh, other studies that will be coming forward that they can uh, say that we want to have more studies like this so that more people are do getting help? Um, my study is funded by NCAM, which is the Complementary and Alternative Medicine Institute of National Institute of Health. And yes, supporting research in general and just talking to your politicians and saying, yes, we support this, we want this to continue is great. Well, thank you so much for sure, coming on to the program. And thank you, Thanks. folks, for tuning in.